Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the Executive Director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Henry Nouwen Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry to audiences around the world. Each week we endeavor to bring you a new interview with someone who's been deeply influenced by the writings of Henry Nouwen, or perhaps even a recording from Henry Nouwen himself. This week, we're returning to chat with a dear friend, Shane Claiborne. Shane is known as a Christian activist. 25 years ago, Shane helped found a community in Philadelphia called The Simple Way. He also teamed up with Tony Campolo to create a movement called Red Letter Christians. Shane is a Christian leader who is willing to speak truth to power. Recently, he participated in the Walk the Walk 2020 March on Washington. Shane and his group went from Charleston, Virginia to Washington, 130 miles. Shane, what was that all about? And why did you do it? Absolutely, yeah. Well, this is one of those times where I think we will look back and our children and grandchildren will ask us, what were you doing back then? (laughs) And I don't want to look back and regret uh, having not done more to resist what I think are some deep-rooted principalities and powers that are surfacing in our country. Uh, And and honestly, I I do think that... um, one of the elders in this, the civil rights movement of the 60s said, if, you know, a lot of people look back with nostalgia thinking, if I were only alive with Dr. King, you know, and he said, whatever you are doing now is exactly what you would have been doing then. And, and you know, so we wanted to do something. And I mean, these are very challenging times with a pandemic alongside uh, this moment of, of racial reckoning in our country. And, and so we wanted to do something that, um, those of us who could be out in the open um, could do responsibly together. So we marched uh, 130 miles from Charlottesville to Washington, D.C. And the reason we did that um, on this Walk the Walk 2020 was um, Charlottesville has a history. I mean, it's actually a long history. More recently, many of us remember the um white supremacists who gathered uh, hundreds of them in Charlottesville. Um, And the centerpiece of that was a Confederate monument that's still there. Uh, And, 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 you know, but as we saw Heather hire a young woman who was killed during that gathering by those uh, white supremacists as they drove a car into the crowd of nonviolent protesters, um, it was the anniversary of that gathering. Uh, it was also the anniversary a week later when we arrived in D.C. of Martin Luther King's March on Washington, where he gave his you know, iconic I Have a Dream speech. Um, and some folks don't know, but that was also the anniversary of Emmett Till's lynching. So I think what we just realized is there's this entire history um, of of racism and injustice, uh, 400 years of it, that is the backdrop of some of what we see happening in our streets today. Uh, I mean, even when we were in Charlottesville, we, we remembered the, uh, Heather Heyer's death. There's a, a, an entire um, a street named after her now and, and memorial to her. Uh, but we also stood on the corner where black bodies were auctioned off um, in the town square. And we, you know, gathered at a site of a, a historic lynching um, in the Charlottesville community there. Uh, so all of that, you know, I think and, and you see these competing narratives uh, around how we remember history. And even in Charlottesville, there's still these Confederate monuments that are there. And you think of um, how we remember history is important. You know, <laughs> you, don't, you don't go to Germany and see monuments to uh, the Nazis, you, you see monuments to all of the lives who were victims um, uh, of, of Nazi Germany. And, uh, you know, you don't remember 9-11 by putting up monuments to the terrorists. We remember the 3,000 lives that were lost uh, in, on 9-11. So somehow with our racial history, we, we really get it wrong. We put up monuments to many of the Confederate generals and the folks that are we're on the wrong side of that history. Um, so as we marched, we held signs that um, said Black Lives Matter. And, and many of the folks in this particular march 
uh, were white clergy. And we, we kind of were one stream that was coming into Washington, D.C. We had other folks that, that you know, are not white, but we, we, we really felt like many of our black and brown brothers and sisters were seeing we, we need white folks to really um, keep reaching out to their community as well, because you've got a role to play in this in this current moment. So uh, I've still got the blisters to show it, Karen, uh, but it was an amazing walk. Um and, you know, we we um, uh, we were met with a lot of love um, and, you know, a fair amount of hostility. One of the most telling things that we encountered as we walked, you know, over 10 miles a day, most of the days there was people would reply to our Black Lives Matter signs by saying all lives matter. And one person even saw uh, our Black Lives Matter and yelled out the window, white lives matter more. And I think what's happening in our country is that a lot of our brothers and sisters of color are asking us to affirm what 400 years of history has uh, negated, um, which is that their lives matter. You know, in our country, um, we we called black folks three-fifths human. We, uh, in the Dred Scott case, ruled that, that black folks don't have any rights that white people have to um, I- acknowledge. And so that history, I think, now is, is something that, that many folks are reckoning with. What, what does it mean to, um, uh, to really affirm that our, our African-American brothers and sisters are made in the image of God and their lives matter? And I, I heard uh, one comedian um, was saying, you know, if, if your wife comes up to you, if your spouse comes up to you and says, baby, do you love me? You don't reply by saying, honey, I love everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is something specific and particular about, uh, I, I think, saying that black lives matter. And it certainly doesn't mean white lives don't matter, but it's just affirming something that, you know, so much of our history uh has really denied. So that's that's what we've been doing, doing our, our little part to try to uh, raise our voice at such a time as this. You know what I find so very moving about this time is that it's not just America. It's it's global. It's almost like something burst and and uh, we see it reflected globally. We see we certainly see it across Canada. I also hear very clearly as well um, indigenous lives matter too, and and yes, we can say all lives matter. But this is this is a time of, as you called it, reckoning. I mean, it's it's a time that's critical for us to to find the new the new way to go forward and to be part of that. I think um, I can't speak for Henry. He's been dead for almost twenty five years, but I was always so very moved by the fact that there as a a Dutch. Uh, a priest, when he came to America, he was so moved by what he saw happening with Martin Luther King that he wanted to be part of that. And when Martin Luther King called for the pastors to come and walk to Montgomery with him, he came. And then, of course, he was there at Martin Luther King's funeral. He wanted to be, he wanted to be part of that. And and it's some very moving things that have been that came from Henry about what that meant to him. And I I don't know where he would be today on. Uh, I think he would be right in the midst of this. I think he'd be cheering you on, Shane. And uh, I wanted to talk with you just, you know, to know uh, who participated. I'm delighted to hear that it was a lot of white pastors entering into saying, we've got to make the changes. We have, uh, you introduced me to something, by the way. You introduced me to, I think it's, is it Daniel Hill, the book, uh, yeah, Wide Awake? Right. And I have really been enjoying that. That's been a a, a blessing to me to read that book particularly and uh uh to uh in a sense understand white privilege you know I I, it wasn't it wasn't my vocabulary in the same way that it is now that I understand okay that's that's something that I have to understand in order to be part of bringing change um I loved a line I came across if you're not outraged you're not paying attention what do you think yeah, absolutely. Incidentally, that was one of the last social media posts that was posted by Heather Hayer, the uh, young woman who was wow. killed in Charlottesville. And I think what a lot of folks are realizing is that um, 
you know, this idea of race is certainly um, a social construct that, you know, it has been has created a whole mythology of racial superiority, you know, based on the color of your skin. And, um, you know, I think quickly a lot of folks just want to say, well, you know, all this happened a long time ago. Uh, we, we are colorblind. All lives matter. You know, I, I don't see black and white. I just see human. And it ignores the fact that those 400 years or more of history still have a residue. You know, they mm-hmm. still leave a mark on our social structures, like our police, uh, our criminal justice system, even hiring practices. It was Freakonomics, I think, that did a, uh, you know, they did a study where they they um, sent resumes to CEOs of companies, to the executives of companies, and the resumes for these jobs were uh, the exact same resumes except for the name. Mm. And interestingly enough, the name of the white sounding person, it was like, uh, you know, it was like Shannon and Shaniqua or Jason and mm-hmm. Jaquil, uh, Matthew and Muhammad. And over and over, the, the, the name that would be most associated with the white uh, kind of dominant culture was the person that was selected over and over for the job. So, I mean, I think that has many different um, manifestations in our society and, um, and, and, you know, in, in some ways privilege is being able to choose which, which, which issues we care about and which ones we don't. It, privilege is being able to opt out of things that affect other people's lives but may not seem like they, you know, directly affect ours. So I think wrestling with that uh, is, is, is so important. Um, you know, I heard someone say, some of us were born on third base, but we act like we hit a triple. <laughs> <laughs> That does sum it up, doesn't it? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, certainly today, I mean, this is the other thing, uh, Karen, that I think is so important is that I think white folks and and especially white folks and black folks are experiencing a different America. And maybe that's true in Canada and other places as well. But they're literally like experiencing the world through different social locations. And, you know, being one that's lived in different environments, it gives me a little bit of a lens through which to, you know, appreciate that. I mean, I grew up in the South in Tennessee. That's why I got, you know, the charming accent, as you know. And uh, but when I was in middle school, you know, if you if you had asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said a police officer at one point because so many of the stories I heard of police officers they were heroic stories, you know, like our firefighters and the things that they had done, and many of those were true stories. But then when I came to Philadelphia, I experienced a really different environment. Um, some of the scariest memories I have of the last twenty five years in Philadelphia have involved the police really acting um, in, in ways that. Um, would have stunned me a couple of decades ago. You know, police officers telling one of my homeless friends that I won't say it on your podcast, but even using horrific words and saying he deserved to die in the gutter. Um, You know, a a police officer that took someone's shoe as they were arresting him for a minor charge and it was in the snow and they threw the shoe over a fence laughing that when he was released from jail, he would have to walk home in the snow, snow with one bare foot. I mean, those are things that, you know, I just I, I, I like I would have never thought of. But I think what's happening is racism isn't getting worse. It's getting revealed, exposed. You know, yeah. people are catching catching it on their yeah. cameras. And, you know, and you can't yeah. you, you, I mean, you can't like not respond to yeah. George Floyd having the life sucked out of him for, you know, eight minutes and 40 some seconds. Like yeah. it just causes you to react. So, yeah. um yeah, and you know, and I'm so grateful for your work with Henry because I was thinking about this as we were going to talk. I knew we would talk about Henry, and uh, um, I, 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 I was thinking, what would Henry Nowen be saying right now? And you know what I thought of, Karen, is I thought Henry Nowen would be listening right now, and so many of us, um, white folks in particular, white men in particular, are very used to speaking. We're quick to speak, but slow to listen. And I think part of what we need to do right now is listen 
to the pain of our brothers and sisters, especially our black and brown and indigenous brothers and sisters who are in the streets, you know, by the thousands saying, we can't breathe. And, and Dr. Martin Luther King said, riot is the language of the unheard. What is it that we're not listening to? You know, when people are not heard, they shout louder. And I certainly uh, believe in nonviolent protests. Um, and yet I'm deeply grieved by a country that seems to often care more about property damage than the damage to black lives. You know, we're better at, at protecting Confederate statues than, than black bodies. And I think that's part of what is getting really named uh, in, in our country. So I think Henry now was such a good listener, but he did show up and he named that. It's so important. You know, Dr. King also said that one of the things that's so heartbreaking is not the hatred of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And, and I think in his letter to the Birmingham jail and so many other places, he points out that, uh, you know, th there are always going to be people who are filled with racism and hatred. But sometimes what, you know, just really grieves your heart is the silence of that sort of majority of people that have a voice, but they might not be using it right now to speak against the kind of injustices that we see sweeping our country. Well, I certainly know that... Um... I've, I've found it inspiring to be following this over the last, I found it particularly inspiring. In the midst of, of COVID, here we have this explosion of something so important and with the potential to change our future. And I really am excited about that. Um, and and I've, I've been inspired by the daring. I've been inspired by the consistency, the fact that people night after night after night are saying, this isn't going away. I'm, I'm going to be part of this. I'm, and yes, I appreciate you saying that we lend our voices. We who have privilege, who recognize we have privilege, not to be silent, but to be part of the vocal, part of the, part of the welcome, part of the determination that things will be different. Yeah, and I think we need to be, you know, reading and listening to those voices that have suffered the brunt of this history. You know, we all of us can survey the books we've read over the last year and think, you know, how many of those are by African women, you know, African-American women, Canadian women, uh, indigenous women. How many of them are by white men? You know, because I think some of those voices, they shape who we are um, and our social location. Uh, you know, the, 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 our worldview is often shaped by what we see out the window. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and so, um, you know, that, that I'm, I got on my desk here, Killing the Black Body by Dorothy Roberts. It, it's a book that we're reading. I'm reading with a bunch of my mostly uh, male friends to think about um, uh, the reproductive uh, rights and what it means to be for life and to, you know, the, the role that race is played and how we thinking, think about black bodies and um, whose, whose lives matter and whose don't, you know. And so uh, on, on the march uh, in, from Charlottesville, we read White Too Long, The Le Legacy of White Supremacy by Robert Jones. And so I think we got to kind of keep um, understanding that because there's a lot of folks that, that would say, well, these are political issues. But I think as we see that the, the word politics it comes from the same root as citizens right like uh, mm -hmm. and to, to love our neighbor as ourself means to care about the policies that are affecting their lives it means that we you know people said the same thing about racism and to, to dr king that's political you know don't talk about it from the pulpit but dr king and so many others they were really clear that that many of these issues are social political and they're spiritual these are really, really deeply spiritual uh, things that, that we're talking about. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm grateful all over our country, leaders, faith leaders have risen up, you know, uh, Tracy Blackman in Ferguson and Reverend Barber in North Carolina and Michael Waters in Dallas and Leslie Callahan in Philly. And I mean, um, Alexia Salvatier out, out in California, I mean, just all over our country, there are uh, leaders uh, that are their faith compels them to do justice right now. So a lot of us are just trying to um, stand in solidarity uh, as, as best we can right now and, and not be a voice for people, but be a voice with them, you know, alongside of them. And rather than speaking for people to actually hold the mic so they can speak for themselves. 
You know, one of the things that happened in the midst of all of this is we lost one of the great treasured leaders, John Lewis. And it was interesting in listening to interviews with him, the spiritual, the political, uh, the social came together in a really beautiful way. It, it was not inseparable, I felt, as I as I heard so much from him. I, I found it really inspiring. Yes. Yeah, and he, he, he knew that he knew that uh, you know, that, that this is also disruptive. You know, when you're talking about uh, justice and, and you, you're often talking about uh, things that challenge the status quo, you know, and uh, Dr. King was very unpopular at the end of his life. You know, <laughs> John Lewis went to jail, was beaten. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, so I think that uh, we we need to cause that good trouble, as John Lewis said. But we're, you know, as we do it, we're trying to win the hearts and minds of people. And I, I literally think that um, that scripture, that perfect love casteth out fear, is really the decision we get to choose right now. Is are we going to choose love or fear? And I think love and fear are like op- opposing magnets. You know, they just can't occupy the same space. And it's no coincidence that all of this is happening on the back of our first black president, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. And there is a sort of white fragility and fear and anxiety in our country that folks that have held the power, you know, we need now see the changing demographics of America, the changing demographics of, of uh, Congress. And white folks are, are very concerned, I think. And yet, you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting when many people say make America great again, they're really saying make America white again. And, and as we think about uh, immigration and how we can welcome people that are fleeing persecution and horrendous things in our country, all of these things are they're they're deeply spiritual. I mean, it couldn't be more clear than when Jesus says, when you uh, welcome the stranger, you welcome me. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we're after. Well, I, I, it's funny when you raise the issue of fear, and it, it is so central to all of us, and it's so to the core. It's actually one of the reasons I think so many people are ministered to by Henry Nouwen is that he looks on the he looks on the heart and the issues of the heart and the whole issue of when we are driven by fear instead of love mm. and trust. And it, it it is an amazing release to to have that. Uh, opened up to us that that there's something better than that to live by let me ask you how's it going with the pandemic in your neck of the woods I mean here we are I think you and I talked kind of at the beginning of that but here we are down the road six months and um, it's everywhere it's worldwide and probably in place for a year ahead of us in 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 some form or another how's it going where you are well, for 25 years, we've been building this community on the north side of Philly, as you know, called the Simple Way. And uh, in some ways, the our prayer has been, my prayer for our community is that we would be both courageous and cautious, right? So that we would not let that fear um, paralyze us from what love really requires of us right now. So many of us have been doing a whole lot of beautiful things, uh, trying to, um, share food with folks that are vulnerable and make sure seniors are taken care of, you know, and kids that are out of school still have nutritious food because they, they can't rely on school lunches, you know? So we've got, uh, we got 10,000 cliff bars donated. <laughs> That's Those you know, really nutritious cliff bars. So we're thankful for that. We've got my friend Miguel Diaz. He's kind of like our neighborhood um, elder. He's, he's officially called a block captain. So he's like the captain of our block. And he is just doing amazing work. We're giving away more food than we've ever given away. We're growing our gardens and um, people are in the neighborhood and able to, you know, help garden. Um so we're still renovating abandoned houses. And, and I think what, what the pandemic has caused for a lot of people is a deep sense of empathy, um, you know, because there most of us have been impacted by someone we know that's had it. Or, but you, you start to think of the people who don't have homes and how vulnerable they are right now when you don't 
uh, or if your home is not a safe place, as in the case of domestic violence, you know, um, uh, folks, we, we really need to be mindful of those who are already vulnerable and the pandemic has just made them even more so. So in Philly, we've got a coalition that's been sharing food with people and we've been given about 600 bags of food out every day. And it's mm. beautiful because there's like people who are wouldn't all agree on politics or on theology, but we can agree that we got to make sure that the folks on the street and, you know, families in our neighborhood are, are able to get food. So that's been a, a beautiful thing that's brought a lot of different groups together. Um, so, yeah, so I, a reporter asked me, when are we going to get back to normal? And I said, I hope never, because normal really wasn't working. You know, normal got us George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Normal got us 700 people in, in the U.S. dying every day from poverty, like uh, 100 people dying every day from gun violence. So I hope that the pandemic is kind of this liminal space that actually invites us to rethink normal, <laughs> you know, and to reconsider what we're going back to. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we come away with a deeper longing for community and connectivity and, and a deeper sensitivity to other people's pain. I love what you're saying, and I would agree with you 100%. And it's actually one of the reasons I love talking with you, Shane, because I think um, you're giving a clarion call to us all, an encouraging call. Yes, let's not go back to what was. Let's go forward and, and in it be awakened to how can we be more compassionate? How can we be part of the solution? I can't help but ask you, what's next for you? What are, what, you know, you, you tend to do lots of things and, and, and energize lots of people. What's next on your horizon? Well, after, you know, 25 years in Philly, Katie and I have been taking some time. We have this, it's, it's called a schoolie. It's a school bus turned into a tiny house. So we've got this solar powered mobile tiny house school bus we're living off of. And we've been spending some quality time with our family in Tennessee and North Carolina. And we've been traveling, you know, doing some of these uh, events like the March that we just did and trying to show up over the next uh, few months in any ways that we can. I think it's a historic, you know, moment in our country. So I'm headed up to Philadelphia this weekend because it's literally the 25th anniversary of when homeless families took over the abandoned Catholic church in our neighborhood. Uh, and, and so we're going to remember that season. And we're also going to, um, to actually address the growing problem of homelessness, you know, in our city. So uh, we'll have pictures. Katie and I got married in that old abandoned cathedral. So I'll be up there on Sunday as we gather and, um, uh, but I'm I'm grateful, you know, for this this time. We've also been, uh, as as you know, I think, and maybe the listeners don't. We Katie and I are both apprentice blacksmiths, so we've been taking guns and uh, turning them into garden tools with a, a national movement now called Raw Tools, uh, which is raw is war flipped backwards. So rawtools.org. Oh. <laughs> so we've got all of our blacksmithing equipment and we've got guns still coming in because you, you've seen even in the pandemic, uh, our gun violence is surging. And so we, we really invited people to donate guns and they, they, they also are make people very vulnerable to suicide. If you have easy access to a gun, that's two thirds of our gun deaths. So we're taking the, we're disarming uh, during the pandemic and melting guns and garden tools. So we're, we're pumped. I love that. I absolutely love that. That's fantastic. I will, we will encourage people to go to your website. We'll give links to all the things that you've talked about here. Shane, thank you for continuing to kind of call us forward call the church forward call us into a unity that is purely based on the love of god the way it needs to be um a, a love in action that really is there for our brothers and sisters no matter where they come from and who they are but fully loved and valued that's so critical well thank you karen thank you for lift, lifting up henry nowen's voice but also your voice and i think there's so many people you know as i think of the people who have he helped you know create the fire in my bones henry is certainly one of those uh and and yet there's there's so many in this cloud of witnesses that's out there so i i'm grateful for you i'm grateful for everybody up there who's uh doing our best to 
stand on the side of love and truth and injustice at such a time as this. So thanks for always being a conversation partner in this, Karen. Thank you, Shane. What a privilege to talk with you. We'll look forward to doing it again soon. And I know I'll keep my eye on you because I know you'll be out there no matter what, making a difference. And that's what I want to be a part of. And we all want to be a part of. Thank you, Shane. I appreciate you so much. Blessings. Thank you. Bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. I love the passion and vision Shane Claiborne has for this time of racial reckoning. I'm glad that he reminded us of the great strength of Henry Nouwen's words, the call to listen really listen to those who have felt marginalized and who have known discrimination because of the color of their skin. This is a call for all of us. I hope you felt inspired by what Shane and others are doing to make a difference. Please feel free to share this podcast with friends and family and invite them to sign up to receive our daily free meditations drawn from the writings of Henry Nowen. For more resources related to today's podcast, click on the links on the podcast page of our website. You can find additional content, book suggestions, and other material, including a link to Books to Get You Started, in case you're new to the writings of Henry Nouwen. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, or follow us on social media for more Henry Nouwen content. For books, videos, and other resources, or if you'd like to receive free daily Henry Nouwen e-meditations, you can follow the links below.